Hello, Ben Mankiewicz here. Welcome to TCM, where this entire Saturday night will be spent in the darkness that lurks in the shadows of America. At midnight Eastern, Eddie Muller returns with Noir Alley after taking August off for Summer Under the Stars. But before we get to Eddie, we have two dynamic adaptations of novels written by one of Noir's defining writers, James M. Kane. Tonight, you'll see the movie versions of two of Kane's best novels, including The Postman Always Rings Twice from 1946. But we begin with a noir masterpiece co-written and directed by Billy Wilder. From Paramount in 1944, Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, and Edward G. Robinson star in Double Indemnity. First, some background on Kane, the novelist. Born in Maryland, he spent most of his life there. Served in the Army during World War I, worked for a time in New York and in Hollywood. But Kane was a Maryland man through and through. He was raised in Annapolis in Chestertown, Maryland, then went to Washington College in Chestertown. Prior to his success as a novelist, Kane was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun and then a college journalism professor. When he retired from Hollywood in 1948, Kane and his wife moved to Hyattsville, Maryland, outside of D.C., and that's where he spent the last 30 years of his life. Kane didn't publish his first novel until he was 42 years old. The Postman Always Rings Twice in 1934. Double Indemnity followed two years later. According to the New York Times, Kane didn't like being labeled a tough guy writer of the 30s or a hard-boiled novelist. I write, he said, of the wish that comes true, which he conceded in his imagination is a terrifying concept, adding that I think my stories have some of the qualities of the opening of a forbidden box. Much of double indemnity was forbidden, scandalous on the page, forbidden in the movies. This is a story of desire, greed, violence, and sex. And as far as the movies were concerned, sex with the wrong people. Somehow, despite a consensus that Kane's story could never be made into a motion picture, Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler fashioned a screenplay acceptable to Hollywood censors. Barbara Stanwyck was never better than she is here, and she was always great. As Phyllis Diedrichson, though, she is arresting. She'll play your heartbeat like a master with his violin, slow, then fast, then trouble. Fred McMurray is cast effectively against type as an insurance salesman and the narrator. Edward G. Robinson is a colleague who investigates potential fraud. Robinson was 49 during production and recognized that his days headlining a cast were likely over. At my age, said Robinson, it was time to begin thinking of character roles. His character here is defined by his tenacity and his humanity. From Paramount in 1944, Double Indemnity. In the final print of Double Indemnity, director Billy Wilder scrapped an ending already shot featuring the execution of Walter Neff, played by Fred McMurray in the gas chamber at Folsom Prison. Although that final sequence aligned more closely to the ending in James M. Cain's novel, it's hard to disagree with the choice Wilder made after watching the subdued, poignant scene you just saw. For Billy Wilder, the voiceover style used in Double Indemnity worked so well that he used it again to perfection in his 1950 film Sunset Boulevard with Gloria Swanson and William Holden as a screenwriter and the narrator. That framing device of a murder and its backstory worked so well that Warner Brothers added the same structure to their adaptation of Kane's novel Mildred Pierce the following year. Like Double Indemnity, Mildred Pierce was a hit, won Joan Crawford an Oscar, reigniting her great career. Coming up, two years after Double Indemnity hit screens, lust once again leads to criminal chaos as Lana Turner and John Garfield star in the adaptation of Kane's first novel, The Postman Always Rings Twice. It's next on TCM. Hi, I'm Ben Mankiewicz. Welcome to TCM and the back half of our double feature of movies adapted from novels by James M. Kane, one of the fathers of noir fiction. We just had Double Indemnity from 1944, drawn from Kane's second novel. His first novel came two years earlier, published in 1934, The Postman Always Rings Twice. Like Double Indemnity, Postman, a story of lust, sex, betrayal, and manipulation, was long considered unfilmable. Silly as it may seem, we lived with a system that allowed us to read books about lust and sex, but we couldn't watch movies about it. Plays, sure, but not movies. We were far too delicate for that. However, director Billy Wilder, who co-wrote Double Indemnity with Raymond Chandler, 
prove to Hollywood that an adaptation of a Kane novel could get past the censors and, more critically, could make a great deal of money. Moreover, a picture based on another Kane book, Mildred Pierce, scored big at the box office in 1945, setting the stage for the screen adaptation of The Postman Always Rings Twice, and that's our next movie, released by MGM in 1946. John Garfield and Lana Turner lead the cast in this American version of Postman. Twice Kane's novel had been adapted in countries that lacked a crusading and Victorian censorship board. France in 1939, then Italy in 43. Kane himself adapted a short-lived stage play in 1936. MGM finally forged ahead with this version, aided in part by a changing post-war social climate. Garfield plays a drifter who ends up at a combo gas station diner in the middle of nowhere. The owner offers him a job, which he turns down until he catches a glimpse of the owner's wife. That's Turner. She gives him a look that will send a tremor down your spine so intense you could spend the rest of your life chasing that one fleeting moment. The film softens some of the bite in Kane's novel, a concession to those censors. Kane, who cared very much that Hollywood made millions of dollars off his movies while he earned something like $100,000, did not care particularly how Hollywood adapted his books. I just don't like movies, Kane once said. People ask me, don't you care what they've done to your books? And I tell them, they haven't done anything to my books. They're right there on the shelf. From MGM, directed by Tay Garnett, one of the studio's biggest hits of 1946. The Postman Always Rings Twice. After seeing The Postman Always Rings Twice, James M. Kane, who wrote the novel, inscribed a leather-bound copy of his book for Lana Turner, thanking her for giving a performance even finer than he expected. The movie elevated Turner's status as the sex symbol of the 1940s, and she became one of the definitive screen femme fatales at the age of just 25. After Postman, Kane did uncredited script work on another defining noir classic, Out of the Past, but after numerous battles with studios, he left Hollywood and returned home to Maryland, writing novels, essays, reviewing books, and mentoring young writers for 30 years until he died in 1977 at 85. Postman got a much-publicized color remake in 1981, starring Jack Nicholson and Jessica Lange, a picture that pushed the sexual limits of its day. It's pretty good, but most movie lovers, certainly most TCM fans, prefer the 1946 version you just saw. James M. Kane has one of my favorite quotes from a writer. As he got older, Kane worried that his writing might be, quote, too good, too easy. Here's what he meant. If you're not lying awake at night worrying about it, Kane said, the reader isn't going to either. I always know that whenever I get a good night's sleep, the next day, I'm not going to get any work done. You know who's getting it done? Noir Alley host Eddie Muller. I'm just kidding. Eddie is incredibly lazy. The Postman Always Rings Twice inspired many imitations, and Eddie has one coming up on Noir Alley. From 1957, hit and run with Cleo Moore and Vince Edwards is next on TCM.